and we are live. Um, I just like to uh, thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, today's VTE webinar, we have the amazing Dan Fornero as our guest. Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. How are you? This how are you today, man? How are things going out there in sunny California? It's good. It's a lazy Sunday. Uh, watching golf come back to TV, which is really something I enjoy on Sundays and uh, on the weekends, and um, end up falling asleep as I would. And it's perfect. And uh, woke up for this. So there you go. <laughs> thanks, man. It's a really it's a big treat for us to have you here. So thanks again. So Dan, uh, why don't you tell everybody about your background? How did you get the horn in your hands, and uh, go from there? Um, the actual background starts in, uh, in before I was born, my father was, a uh, was, a uh, uh, drafted into the Korean war and, um, along with his best friend. And, um, uh, and so they, uh, they found each other, uh, at, after the, uh, the uh, treaty was signed and my dad went and found out, found out that his buddy was on, on the hill next door. So he made a day trek and went over and found him and surprised him. And, uh, and they said, if, uh, if we do get out of here alive, let's, let's form a drum and beagle corps. And they both survived the war and, uh, and they did exactly that. Uh, John Vagnoni was his name, he's still alive. And uh, I spoke to him just last month about all of this stuff and trying to, uh, uh, trying to make sure that, that I get this story accurate. My father unfortunately passed away a year ago, um, but what they did was uh, they formed a, a, a senior drum and beagle corps for, for people who were 21 and older, and they called it uh, the Kenosha Kingsmen, and we were in Kenosha, Wisconsin, that's where I'm from. Yeah. And uh, they started in the mid-50s, and uh, I was born uh, sometime after that, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, so my first memories of childhood were going to all the rehearsals. Um, uh, in Wisconsin, the rehearsal period is mostly indoors because, you know, you get six months of winter, you know? Oh, yeah. So they would have these, uh, these you know, rehearsals with where I was hearing, you know, 20 or 30 horns, you know, doing what, you know, blazing away at upstairs at the Danish Brotherhood or the VFW or, the, you know, the Eagles Club or, you know, the different places they would rehearse. And in the summer when they would, would rehearse outside marching, I would hear all of that. And as I, you know, uh, was growing up that was the first things I had ever been exposed to and all I wanted to do was be those guys you know and uh, the guy who was their best uh, soprano bugle player was this guy named Corky Gendrick and he um, uh, was somebody I admired right away and so um, I just wanted to be in the drum and bugle corps and learn how to play a bugle like those guys and when I turned 10 years old I was eligible to join a corps there was a um, uh, a, a really very successful drum and beagle court 10 miles north of us in Racine, Wisconsin called the Kilties. And at that time they were, you know, VFW champs and all of that stuff. DCI hadn't been formed yet. Oh. And um, uh, so uh, they had a feeder corps called the Kilty Cadets for kids who were 10 to 14. And then once you were 14, you could move into the Kilties. And it was a really good idea because not only, you know, did it give something for, for, for kids my age to, you know, how to get involved in all of that. But it also, by the time we got old enough to be in the Kilties, we were, we had, a, you know, we were pretty seasoned and they got a really good, you know, crop every year, you know? And um, so I did that for the, from, from 10 to 14 for four years, I marched in that. I learned how to play a bugle there. And about a year and a half after that, I realized the other kids were playing trumpets. They were in public schools. Most of them, I went to a, parochial Catholic school with no band program. And so um, my only exposure to brass was a bugle. And, you know, the, the guys I was marching with were in bands with trumpets and a third valve and notes they could play. We only had a piston and a rotor. So the horn could only, it was limited to certain keys. You know, you, yeah. could, you couldn't hit anything that required a third valve. And so um, uh, I wanted to learn trumpet. And uh, when I, so I, I, uh, my parents allowed me to get out of parochial elementary school. And when I was in seventh grade, I went to uh, Lincoln Junior High and uh, in the tough part of town. And um, and a tough guy I wasn't and with a big mouth. Which is <laughs> and uh, if you listen to the first track off my record, shameless plug here, uh, not so old school, 
first track's called Gonna Be Fine, and, and it's the story of what I'm telling you, basically. And, and um, when I got to Lincoln Junior High, I learned to play trumpet. And um, uh, it was, uh, I already had a year and a half of Bugle behind me, so it kind of fell real, real right. Yeah. And it just sort of went from there, you know. So, um, so let's talk about, so you got, you, uh, like, who was, was your dad your teacher as far as trumpet, or was he? Au contraire. <laughs> okay, I didn't know. Yeah. I'll tell you a little sidebar story here yeah. since we have some time. It's a pretty great one. Um, my father and his brother, Don, who is my godfather, yeah. uh, they both played baritone bugles in, um, in, in the drum corps and uh, the Kenosha Kingsmen, and they were horrible. And uh, <laughs> they were. And, and um, uh, John Vagnoni was the snare drummer, so he, he led the drums, but in, in him and my dad were the founders. But uh, my dad and his brother, they didn't play very well. And so a lot of the guys did, you know, there was not a lot of, you know, training. So the, the guy who was the instructor would tune them all, you know, and uh, you'd say, bah, you're, you're, you know, push in, you're flat, bah, pull out, bah, fine, bah, bah. And it gets my dad to go, foo. And it gets my uncle down to be foo, bah, 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 bah. So they actually nicknamed them the foo brothers. <laughs> and, uh, and I knew that all growing up. And, yeah. and, if you flash forward to when I went to college, I went to North Texas for four years. And, uh, and uh, the last semester before I, I left North Texas, I did my final, not my final jury, but my last jury. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Haney was, uh, John Haney was the professor of the Trump department. And without ever knowing the story, he wrote on his critique of me, he said, uh, you need to work on your attacks, no more foo-foo. True story. And he <laughs> didn't know the story. Oh, wow. And so when I came home with this terrible critique, I was never more proud, you know? <laughs> and I showed it to my dad and my uncle Don, I said, check this out, man. And then you're one of us. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's a great story. It's really a true one and, and one that we, we really uh, enjoyed. All, this, all these years. You know, my Uncle Donnie, uh, he passed uh, three weeks after my father passed. And uh, it was a really tough year uh, a year ago. It was, it was a tough time. Uh, but we definitely, uh, we shared that all these years, you know, and uh, it was kind of neat. That's so awesome, man. So my teachers, you asked about my teachers. Yeah. And I've been very fortunate in that the school system in Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, when I was growing up in the 70s was was extraordinary and uh, it was it was it was the result of great administrative uh, uh, leadership uh, by uh, a guy named Ralph Houghton who is uh, Steve Houghton's father Steve oh Houghton. wow yeah the drummer Steve one of the finest drummers you'll ever hear yeah anywhere uh, and a great educator as well and uh, his father um, uh, as I understand it uh, got relationships going with the different music stores in town to make rental instruments affordable for kids starting in fifth grade. So the, the public school system, uh, kids were starting in fifth grade with, with teachers. Mm. By the time I got involved in seventh grade, you know, kids were already playing for a couple of years, you know. And there was a lot of drum and beagle corps going on outside of all of that. So there was a ton of music going on at a very high level uh, at that time. And the guys I was playing with in drum corps were, you know, much better than me and people I could really learn from. And uh, the same thing was true in high school, uh, in junior high and high school for that matter. But in high school particularly, there was a trumpet player uh, by the name of John Fumo, who is a freelance trumpet player in Los Angeles, yeah. who is as good as he he was tremendous when he was a kid and he's you know we do the same thing for a living and we live out here and he's one of my dearest oldest friends and um and so I had him to look up to all the way through high school and to try to try to you know uh, attain the skill set he had and pick his brain the best I could you know and um uh, so I was, I was always surrounded by people better than me which is what's so great about moving to los angeles you know i'll go to work every day and, and people around me are better players and so i go okay great what can i learn from this guy and that guy and it's just a constant uh, that's the way i've lived my life really it's just you know going to school and everybody else around me and if you come to the you know come to los angeles or new york that's going to happen you know yeah. 
be you're going to be surrounded by people who just got it going on you know and uh it's been that way from since i was since i was you know quite young that's yeah that's it's it's very true what you say about uh la and those demographics like the one you're in now um so what what type of player were you in high school like you know, a lot of a lot of the misconceptions from a lot of people are like, you know, you being one of the top players in L.A., you know, you know, they're like, oh, he was probably one of the top players in high school or he was. What were you like as a high school? Like, what were some of the prop? Um, some of the did you have any issues as a young player? Like, what were some of the things like what were, kind of player were you like in high school? Well, what kind of player you mean musically? Or yeah, what? musically, like, you know, um, you know, uh, I took trumpet lessons all from seventh grade on. And so everything was out of the Arvin's book, you know. And so um, I learned to play, you know, as, as properly as I could. Yeah. Um, I had a real knack for uh, for playing uh, jazz and big band. Um, my father did influence me very strongly in that. He was a, a, a loved the big band stuff. And he would, he would take me to see, you know, uh, Buddy Rich when he was in town never missed Stan Kenton. That was his all-time favorite. Uh, Woody Herman would come into town and or anywhere within, really within 50 miles, we were there, you know. And uh, we caught all of that stuff, Maynard Ferguson's band. He actually, uh, uh, I got in some trouble when I was, uh, let's see, I was, I was 14 uh, and I got in some trouble uh, it, and so they, my parents grounded me actually for the entire second semester of that year of school. I mean, I, I, wow. I got involved in some things that you don't want to get involved in when you're yeah. young. And, um, and so they let me out though, to see um, uh, uh, Chicago live. Nice. My dad took me to that concert in Milwaukee and they let me out to see uh, Bill Chase live uh, in February of 74 and he died in August. So wow. It was, uh, you know, um, he was very influential in making sure that I heard all kinds of music. And so that music was pretty much where I came from, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, as much as I was learning to play classically or properly or however you want to look at right. that, call it, uh, you know, popular music and jazz and, and all of that was really kind of st sticking pretty hard with me you know but in my high school was we we had an amazing program I mean, they, there was my high school had a marching band it had six choirs it had a concert band it had a symphonic band it had a wind ensemble and it had a 60 or 80 piece orchestra that used brass five days a week wow. so i would get up for, you know, for school, and I would go and uh, hate, take geometry or something, and then I'd be right into wind ensemble for an hour, followed by orchestra for an hour, and we also had two jazz ensembles that met uh, twice a week at in at night. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, I, I made a little jazz combo with some buddies of mine, and we were, you know, playing standards and and, and occasionally working and stuff, doing oh, gigs wow. a little, little bit here and there. So the, you know. And then the you know I did the Kilties uh, for, I did four years of the Kilty Cadets and then I, a year of the Kilties so there was it was just constant playing all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Uh, so you know you're you're in high school. Is there a point with you, Dan, that you said this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? Yeah, and it was honestly I it, it, I kind of. I kind of always just wanted to do this. I don't remember not wanting to do this, seriously. But the point where it really were, you know, whatever was already sparked, you know, was full blown explosion was, was in, uh, in 1975, uh, I went to an Abersol camp and uh, uh, in uh, Northern Illinois. And I went there because John Fumo told me that's what he did the year before. And if Fumo said it, I was doing it. I mean, he was he was quite an influence yeah. and uh, somebody I really, really admired and still do very, very much. And um, uh, he said, you know, I went to the Sabersault camp. So I quit drum corps in the fall because in August of the next year, there would be an Abersault camp and that would have conflicted with going to DCI, mm -hmm. which was I think in its second or third year at that point. And so uh, I, that's how I left drum corps. I never looked back. I never went, I never saw another drum corps show. I still haven't uh, since I left. 
Um, uh, and so um, uh, I went to that Abersol camp and it started on a Sunday and then, then you went till uh, Saturday, you went back home. So I was, I was, you know, I was 15 years old and I was gonna go uh, away for a week and live in a dormitory and learn, learn, you know, whatever this jazz thing is that I like and find out what a Dorian scale is and things like that, get some theory for the first time. And uh, they were all talking, they were all excited that on Tuesday, uh, uh, Joe Henderson and Woody Shaw were coming to the camp. Oh, wow. Now this is 1975. Uh, Woody Shaw only had one record out under his own name, oh. it was Moon Train at that time. And uh, Joe Henderson was already Joe, but you know, the older guys that were at the camp and they were you know, mostly, you know, all ages through college and all that. I was mm. one of the younger guys there. They, they seem to know who Woody and I'm like, who's Woody Shaw? I'm like, you're not going to believe this. Well, they played a concert that first night. Uh, they arrived on Tuesday. Mm. And uh, if you open on, on the Jamie Abersall, Woody Shaw uh, set, the, the booklet that comes with it with all the music. And if you open it up, the, the picture on the inside of the front cover it says Woody Shaw, Joe Henderson, 1975, Northern Illinois Jazz Camp. That's the night I'm talking of. They, that picture exists there. And there was, you know, maybe a hundred of us in the audience from that camp. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that, A, I didn't know what the heck it was. I just, I'd never imagined. My, my heroes, you know, were, were Maynard and Chase and Doc Severinsen, you know, my, my uh, you know, um, my my look into into real jazz improvisation I, I kind of dug some Clark Terry and stuff but really it wasn't about that for me at all so I didn't understand at all it's actually frankly I still don't understand <laughs> what what he was doing but it, it's just so mind-boggling to me but but in fact uh, when I heard it, it I just cried I, I lost it I just sat there and I said there's nothing else the rest of my life I want to be involved with more than playing trumpet you know, I, yeah. I, it was just an absolutely profound moment of, man, I am in the right place. This was, I'm glad I quit drum corps last year for this. Fumo was right. And whatever that is, I got to figure it out, you know, and I'm, I'm moving in this direction. Uh, Ralph Houghton, as I mentioned earlier, who mm -hmm. spearheaded the music program in Kenosha, his son, Steve, was a, very much uh, someone who gave me guidance. Uh, he went down to North Texas, therefore... I should go to North Texas because that's what you do. Mm -hmm. you get down to North Texas, maybe somebody will hear you like Stan Kenton's band and I could join that band I've been listening to my whole life through my father. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just, that's just what you do, you know? Yeah. So, you know, uh, uh, I got a lot of uh, direction that way. You know? there, uh, you, there's a recording, just a side note. There's a recording of you at North Texas playing between Maynard Ferguson. Mm -hmm. is, is that you? In the 80s? Is that? No, I was there uh, 77 through 81. Okay, then maybe that's not you, though. No, maybe it was mislabeled. <laughs> Sorry. I was like, it yeah. sounded like you, but um, you know, so the, uh, did, did you, you um, so you're, you're, uh, you're in college, you're doing the college thing, you're, you know, you're waiting for the bus to come, I guess, you know, uh, what was your, what was your direction? Did you have like a, a, a like, okay, well, if Stan doesn't come pick me up or something like that, I'm going to move here. What was your direction like when you were in college? Or well, when I when I went to North Texas, the idea was I want to get in the one o'clock band someday because that's like it's like the best barometer, it's like a benchmark. You know, it's kind of a you can look at that and go, okay, look, if I could if I could make it there, I'll make it anywhere. That kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So I thought, okay, if I could make fourth trumpet in the one o'clock band. I'll know at least that I have a chance, you know, of, of getting somewhere. And when I went to North Texas, there were 145 trumpet players in the school. Yeah, it was 1977. The, the lab band thing was, you know, exploding. I mean, Lab 75, the whole Lyle Mays thing had just happened, you know, recently. And, and the band, you know, the, the program was, was phenomenal. And um, uh, so I, I auditioned and I, I had the, the good sense in, in high school to take uh, some sight reading lessons from a guy named Tim Bell, rest his soul. Tim Bell was, a, was on staff at North Texas for many years, played in the one o'clock band for, for many years and uh, prior to that. And um, 
uh, he became the director of jazz studies in Kenosha, Wisconsin at University of Wisconsin at Parkside. And he brought a lot of that music with him. And, and uh, he really, uh, he, he took advantage of all the great players that were up there and really, really brought that thing to life. He was a magnificent guy, a great player and a great educator. So I went and saw him my senior year of high school. I said, look, I want to go down to North Texas. I heard you came from there. I need to learn to sight read because that's the audition. Can you help me? And he did. And he gave me some lessons on, on sight reading. And I had become, become pretty, pretty good, I, I thought, you know, by the time I was a senior in high school and I was ready and I was hungry, mm -hmm. you know, and I was going to North Texas finally after all these years of wanting it, you know, it's just tunnel vision, you know. And I got down there and I did an audition that I was real happy with. And uh, at that time, and, and probably today, they, they have nine jazz bands, the one o'clock through the nine o'clock band, mm -hmm. nine o'clock being the worst band, one o'clock being the best. And they actually met at their o'clocks. Yeah. And, uh, and um, I'm, you auditioned uh, either for first trumpet, uh, jazz solo, or section chairs. And so I did the math on it. There's nine lead players, there's nine soloists, there's 27 sections chairs, the one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, those are out of play. Yeah. You know, it's not going to happen for an 18 year old. And um, uh, so I tried for section chair and I made fourth trumpet in the eight o'clock band. I was three chairs away from no band at all. And I thought I had my stuff pretty together. Wow. You know, it was really something. And um, uh, they allowed me to uh, uh, play a little lead that they heard something in me and said, give them a lead chart. And they let me play a lead tune on a concert. And, um, and I, recognized that you know I was hearing the guys around me I thought I can I can I can hang with that you know I, I think I'm good enough to hang with those guys so I auditioned the following semester and I made first trumpet in the six o'clock band and uh and that was the end of my first year second year I came back uh, auditioned and I made first trumpet in the three o'clock and the following semester first trumpet in the two o'clock band and when I came back to my third year of college um uh, the incumbent lead trumpet player, uh, the great Tom DeLibro, who lives wow, in yeah. he was back in school. And, and I made this two o'clock again to start my third year. And then about two weeks into the school year, DeLibro dropped out and went to, because uh, he got, got a steady gig at the, the Sands or the Dunes, something like that in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in, in my, my place one day and my buddy came by, he goes, man, DeLibro took a gig in Vegas. I'm like, oh, that's cool, yeah. He goes, you're the lead trumpet player in the one o'clock band. I was like, excuse me? <laughs> Do that again, you know? And, uh, and I did that for the next two years. So, uh, you know, I, I've noticed, especially there's a, um, a lot of players like, like yourself talk about, you know, after, after college, after school, there's this, this prep period or this, this period where you, you earn your stripes, you earn your reputation, you know, wh where did you, what, after college, wh how did, where and when, or where and with who did you do that with? It's a really, really great point. I mean, we, we called it paying your dues. Yeah. You had to pay your dues. If you weren't paying your dues, you weren't going to get there. And if you got there, you didn't earn it unless you paid your dues. Yeah. And, um, and I, you know, when I was in school, uh, my first year, uh, first year in the one o'clock band, the third year of college, Stan Kenton died. And so uh, my dream of getting on his band was not going to happen. And so then my, my next goal was Woody Herman. That was the one I wanted to be on. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there was a band that would come through uh, Dallas and play ballrooms. Uh, it was called Al Pearson Big Band USA. And it was uh, led by Al Pearson, who played piano. And he had uh, three trumpets, uh, two trombones, a four-piece sax section, and the rhythm section. And they would tour a ballroom circuit from Cleveland to Omaha to Dallas, basically that triangle. Excuse me. And they would hit all the old uh, ballrooms, you know, in the real ballroom dancer kind of situation, you know, like what you see on Dance with Stars, where it's all proper. And he was one of the more popular ones. Russ Morgan was another one of those guys. And, and, but Al was real authentic. If it was a Beguine, it was a proper tempo compared to a cha-cha, compared to a blah, blah. He kicked off every tune with a metronome. And, you know, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was dues, 
you know. And but I, I was being hired by him when he came through Dallas while I was in college. So when I got out of college, he offered me the gig. And so I went from playing first trumpet for two years in the one o'clock band to playing third trumpet out of three on the road for three hundred dollars a week. And it was thrilling. I was so glad I, you know, I'm working now, man, and I'm paying my dues. And when Woody Herman calls someday, it won't be my first time on a tour bus because I know I'll be scared to death on Woody's band and I'll at least have the experience of, uh, of what I'm learning here. And I did that band for, for uh, six months until he fired me and uh, with good reason. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went home to Wisconsin for about two months and then I just relocated to Los Angeles. What was the drive to go to LA? Like a lot of guys say that there's something there's something they said, well, there's the recording, that's the hot spot, you know, or there's New York. I mean, you're closer to New York. What was the, the drive to go to LA? That's, the, that's another really good question. Yeah. Um, you know, sitting in a dorm room at, in North Texas, well, well what's it gonna be? Is it gonna be New York? Is it gonna be LA? Well, you know, when I first got to North Texas, I wanted to just learn harmony and just go down that path. I learned at Abersol camps and just be the next Woody Shaw and just get, enough money to make rent and food and some extracurricular activities and get a loft in Manhattan and a drum set and just explore jazz the rest of my life, you know. But after I found more success playing lead trumpet, I realized that that kind of work and the kind of player I really was better, was better suited for something like Los Angeles. Additionally, uh, I was in the dorm room maybe my first year there and Conrad Herwig, the great trombonist, uh, we were the same age. We were, we, were, we were quite close friends back then and came to my dorm room and he said, hey, you need to hear this side, man. It's called Lab 68. It's the one o'clock band back in 68. He says, you got to hear this to believe it, man. It's got this uh, trombone feature on there called Hello Young Lovers uh, for Bruce Fowler, you know. Oh, wow. And a Jim Richmond arrangement. And I uh, put that side on, man, you know, and you know, like we did, we just listened to records constantly. And, uh, and, uh, and he put it on and I was like, that's extraordinary. I said, who's that lead trumpet player? That's the best thing I've ever imagined. And he said, well, that's the guy who's on the records you're playing along with all the time, those pop records you're playing to, you know? And uh, his name is Gary Grant. And I said, then I gotta meet Gary Grant. That's it. And again, tunnel vision, how am I gonna meet Gary Grant? I studied with Don Jacoby uh, oh, wow. from school uh, for the last uh, uh, three years of college. And, um, uh, and he had a trumpet hang and he brought in Yuan Racy, Manny Klein, Ray Cressera, Jimmy Burke, uh, and Dalton Smith. And Dalton Smith and I became real fast friends. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I said, hey man, you know, do you know Gary Grant? He goes, he's my best friend. And I said, well, I need to meet him. He said, well, come on out to LA. So I did at like Easter breaks and Thanksgiving breaks. I was just going to LA. And then he would take me to recording sessions and I got to meet Gary Grant and Jerry Hay and Larry Hall and, and uh, sit behind these guys and watch them work on, on shows like Chips with Alan Silvestri, very yeah. Silvestri doing the arranging and conducting. And, and um, uh, you know, when I met Gary Grant and heard Gary Grant, I knew that was the, 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 now the new focus. You know, it was, it was, I want to play like that guy. You know, he was the next, he was the next one up the thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. The way I've lived my life, just who, 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 you know. And so we became uh, uh, friends and, um, uh, and he ended up you know, producing my record with, with uh, Wally Minko. And uh, he's uh, uh, been my mentor since before I met him. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, it's the truth. So, you know, uh, in a so that's I, I, LA was, was <laughs> kind of you know that right. that direction in music and Gary Grant. Oh, well, that, that's that that would be good reason to go to LA. Um, one of one of the things I hear a lot of guys talk about, and you know, Dan, this is this is a very educational thing. I you know I try to do this for a lot of people who want to do what you do but they don't teach this in academia. So it's great to hear it from the source, from the guys doing the work. You know, a lot of people think I have a name. I can go to New York or LA and I'm, I'll, I'll just bypass the line. And that's, that's further from the truth, right? It doesn't matter if you played with Maynard or whoever. So 
can you tell us about you get to Los Angeles, you know these guys and they know you, but how did you work your way up? And you know, what what did you do as a player to kind of get into those circles? So those circles are very hard to get into. You're really asking great questions here, man. Yeah. Because when I first got to Los Angeles, oh, let me back up. When I was at North Texas, I had that thought in mind. It's like, okay, great. Now that I'm in the one o'clock band, when I move to New York and move to LA, I'm going to have that on my resume. You know, they're not going to look to see if I got a bachelor's degree. They're going to say, what have you done? You know, yeah. and it speaks pretty loud, you know? And, um, but when I got to Los Angeles, there was a, there was a player in town uh, who wore his North Texas on his sleeve a little too loudly. And people got really annoyed by him. And he made some statements about, about himself being, you know, the greatest thing since whatever. And it became pe people who looked after me or I got some good advice from people who cared in some way. It said, don't, don't be talking about being a lead Trump player in North Texas. Don't do it because we're tired of that shit. Excuse me. We're tired of that here. You yeah. know, I mean, it doesn't matter what you've done. It's what are you doing now? Who are you? Yeah. Do, are you somebody we want to have around? Are we going to be, you know, this big show off braggadocio, you know, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it was something that, that I really kind of wanted to wear real proudly. Cause I, you know, it was an achievement I was real proud of, but I couldn't talk about it. Yeah. People would say, where'd you go to school? I go, Oh, North of Dallas. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. And uh it's kind of a drag because I wanted to be <laughs> I wanted to be able to talk about it more. Uh, but what I did uh to get ahead uh was I, I asked around, so well, how do how do I make a living here? You know, what do I do now? You know, and um and they said, Well, there's all these rehearsal bands at the union. Yeah. And uh uh they're always needing subs, you know because guys are working and they're doing rehearsal bands. And when they need a, a sub for a rehearsal band, it's hard to get somebody to sub because there's no money. <laughs> yeah. And so they said, so go to the rehearsal bands, go listen to them, meet some guys, you know, and just tell them, look, you know, if, if you never need a sub for third trumpet next Tuesday, or, you know, here's my number, call me. I'm, I'd be happy to do it, you know, and then they did. Guys were like, yeah, man, sure. That guy went to North Texas or whatever, you know, they had heard, you know, and, and uh, you know, they gave me a shot. And so I played in these bands and, uh, and a lot of them, I mean, you know, eight or 10 big bands and you kind of eventually you're, they throw you a lead chart and it's your time to, mm -hmm. you know, step into that. And Hey, that's pretty cool. And then the next thing, you know, the, the lead player calls you and says, Hey man, I can't make a rehearsal. Can you make it? And you just sort of get heard. Mm -hmm. And it just started to snowball a little bit from there slowly, but you know, eventually, my wife, you know, she worked uh, full time uh, when we first got married. Uh, I was in town for, I, I moved to LA in 82. I was here for six months and I left for a year with Woody Herman. And in that first week on Woody's band, I met my wife and we were married uh, 14 months after that. So when I got off the band and got married, uh, she worked the first four years of our marriage full time with, mm -hmm. uh, in accounting firms as a secretary so that I could get my feet running in town. And uh, I landed a gig in 1988 playing for uh, Tom Jones and she was able to stop working and, and you know, go home and be a mom to our daughter. Mm -hmm. and, and so she really, you know, she really uh, facilitated a lot of, of what it took in the very beginning for me to, to get heard, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and, uh, and, and to survive, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do it without that. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's another thing too. I mean, a lot of guys don't talk about the sacrifices that they made, you know, they make going on the road and it's tough on a marriage and being a father. And a lot of guys don't talk about that, but well, um, the sacrifice isn't so much. Yeah. Ours. It's, it's, yeah. it's on them. It's on us. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. We're out there doing our thing. You know what I mean? How yeah. lucky are we, right? So uh, can we, uh, I, and I'm getting a lot of questions. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, uh, the Brian Setzer Orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, you were their lead player for what, four albums? Am I right? Four or five albums? Uh, when the band was conceived, uh, I was thought of for the first trumpet, John Fumo on the second trumpet. Right. And, uh, and we, we put uh, uh, um, 
they, they opened up a guy's living room and moved the furniture out. We put in music stands and got a bunch of beer. <laughs> and, you know, and uh, 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 Mike Acosta's house in, in Santa Monica and down the block was Setzer. And he had met him and had a conversation and they were going to try this experiment. And this rock and guitar guy I'd never heard of came in and, and it took off from there. And I did the first three albums. First three albums. And whenever they were touring, uh, uh, I was always on tour with other artists. So I didn't do a whole lot of traveling with them. Mm. But when I was available, then the, they would bring me out mid tour sometimes to finish yeah. tours and things like that. Mostly I did the gigs uh, that were in town, did a, a couple of gigs in New York, uh, and, but in a, in a very small amount of touring. But after the third album, uh, they had moved on without me. Uh, well, let's, uh, a lot of people have asked me about the book. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it. I, I, I know a buddy, a couple of buddies of mine that play the book now, and it's not for the squeamish. It's it's a very demanding book. Mm -hmm. And um, what was your? I mean, was it something that you had prepared for, or was it something you're like, oh, this is this is going to be a haul, man? You know, is it? Did uh, you and John trade off? It just, well, yeah, oh, of course. But primarily, at that time, I mean, my range was better back then than it is mm -hmm. now, and and so it was. It's just sort of like bring it, you know. <laughs> that's it's, awesome. Yeah, you know, that's kind of the attitude we took, and it was a real party, man. I mean, when it started off, it was a cigar smoking, you know, martini swelling event. Yeah, and it was just an absolute riot. It was out of control. We did, uh, it was out of control, let's leave it there. <laughs> but, but after uh, after some time, I kind of cleaned up my life and, and stopped uh, stopped the whole party thing. Yeah. And um, it, it sort of changed uh, how much fun that was to do anymore. And it really did become more and more demanding. Yeah. Um, when it was just fun and games, that's exactly what it was. It was fun and games and getting paid with your buddies, you know. It was, it was yeah. pretty, I was really happy to be part of that. You guys sound, I mean, on those albums, if you guys, uh, some of you listening don't know the Brian Sess Orchestra, there's a, uh, there's an album that uh, they said this trumpet section sounds amazing. And um, so go check that out. Uh, so let's, let's talk about one of the things I, I want to talk to you about, Dan, is, um, and we'll get into the, the other bands that you're, you know, you're, but I want to talk about your opinion on what separates the professional trumpet player from the trumpet player, uh, I guess the, the the men from the boys, I guess you know what separates the the pros from the studio pros, in your opinion, in a demographic like yours. Opportunity, maybe. I mean, I I really don't know how to answer that, frankly. Um, yeah. There's a whole lot of trumpet players, way better than I am, who aren't working. You know, it's just. You, you got to be in the right place at the right time. Try to keep your mouth shut. Open it only when it's going to help. Keep it closed when it's going to hurt. Um, That's a great advice. That's great advice. There was, there was a, you know, when, when you get somewhere, you want to take it easy. You don't want to, like, let me back up on this because it, it touches on what you asked me earlier, you know, what, about not being able to wear North Texas on my sleeve mm -hmm. because of, of, you know, the reputation that had been established by someone who got there before me was a real gift. Mm -hmm. This big mouth would have, would have sunk my own ship, you know. I wouldn't have had a chance to get out of the dock, you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, uh, I was, uh, I took a lesson from uh, George Graham, who was a tremendous, just monster lead trumpet player. Mm -hmm. We were playing together with different bands when I was doing all those big bands. And, and I said, can I take a lesson from you? He said, sure, kid, come on over we'll do lunch at my house in Glendale. And I went over there and we did that and we practiced together. He showed me some stuff, we had some lunch. And he said, you know, he said, you play really good, kid. And he said, but I'm gonna give you some great advice. He said, uh, he said, slow down. He said, uh, he says, you have a lot to offer and you're gonna do fine. He said, but it's better to uh, get discovered than it is to get found out. Uh -huh. right so mm -hmm. if i hadn't hadn't been given the advice of don't don't blast that north texas shit everywhere when you yeah the town you know uh it 
you know, it wasn't a total secret, but it wasn't something I could mm -hmm. shout from the hilltops like I wanted to. That was a real, real lucky thing for me, you know. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't know what separates the quote men from the boys. Uh, I do know that when I go to work, I have an opportunity to grow from everybody around me. And so I try to do that yeah. as much as I can. And uh, uh, I feel like I'm very fortunate. Uh, I think everybody that I work with would say the same thing. We all feel very fortunate mm -hmm. to be working. And, uh, you know, we're just going to keep practicing and try to make that phone ring. And, right. and it's just kind of what it is. I mean, if you're really a great trumpet player and you're living in, you know, Dubuque, uh, that's great. But the opportunities are going to be less for you there, you know. Uh, if you want to take on New York City and go out and, and do that, uh, then, you know, be prepared for a very, 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 very long wait before you're working. If you mm -hmm. want to move to Los Angeles and break into the, to the biz and, and, you know, and all that stuff, you better be prepared to be 40 years old before that really happens for you. Yeah. It, and, and that's only if there's a business left by the time you're 40, you know what I mean? So it's that kind of thing. You know, it's just... Mm -hmm. A, you, you, it's, what is it they say they say luck is where preparation meets opportunity it's, right. there's a lot of that you know um, you have to be of a certain level but there's a lot of other things that have to go right too right. separating the men's from the boys and all that I'm not sure I buy into all of that you know yeah you know? Uh, no I, I agree and uh, it, like I said you're, you're in a demographic where there's plenty of qualified personnel you know there, there's a plethora of qualified personnel and um yeah it's just you know it, i've heard it's just it's just luck being at the right place at the right time and uh again keeping your mouth shut you know and open right that's a big thing especially in the studios uh so let's uh I, gosh we're at 12 45 i i'm gonna start getting to some of these questions i'm sorry dan it's just so off let's go that's cool um so dan let me uh, you uh Let's talk about Gordon Goodwin a little bit. Let's talk about playing in that band, playing with guys like Wayne and Andy. And, you know, um, you know, th that's a tough gig, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well, can, can we talk about like, you know, some of the, did you, like getting the call from Gordon and did you prep? Did you like, what, what were some of the things that you did? I was on the road in uh, 2000 one or two touring with Neil Diamond. We were playing uh, in an arena on the East Coast and the phone rang and it showed up and it said Wayne Bergeron on there. And because I was doing so much touring, uh, I, you, you think people don't know what you're doing and, and maybe they didn't. So I always tried to, I never announced, you know, this is, mind you, it's before Facebook and all that stuff, yeah. but I wouldn't, you know, put on my voicemail, hey, I'm out of town until April, yeah. leave me a message. It was like, I wanted people to think I still was at home, you know. Yeah. So Wayne called me, he said, hey, man, there's this gig coming up with the big fat band and um, uh, our second trumpet player, split player, split lead player can't make it. Uh, and I'm wondering, man, is there any chance you could do something uh, with the band? would love to, love to give you a shot at this next Thursday. And I said, uh, I said, uh, yeah, just a second, let me check my schedule. And I just put the phone down and I walked around for about five minutes, knowing that I was on the road for the next three months, you know. And they went, oh man, I'm sorry, I got a thing that night. There's nothing, I can't get out of it, you know. And I tried to play it off, you know. But that's that was the first time that uh, that he sounded me on it. And, and then I got back in town and, and I don't remember how it happened after that, but they asked me to get involved in some way and it, they liked it and it, and it, and it stuck. But my first experiences on the band, A, scared to death. I'll tell you right now, scared to death. Those guys were a well-oiled machine. They could read anything he wrote. The first time you heard it, you might hear a couple things. You wouldn't hear them the second time. It was that kind of environment. And I was thrilled to be asked to be part of it and scared to death that I wasn't going to measure up. And in front of me was uh, Alex Isles and Andy Martin. Oh, wow. And so uh, Alex would turn around when, you know, Wayne and I would hit something and it would, it would be going well. And Alex would turn around and go, yeah, man, you know, and then I'd miss a clinker and then I'd get the ray from Andy Martin. And he would turn around like, really? really? You know, 
it was heavy, you know. Yeah. I had a real knack, and I still do, uh, for falling in the holes. Uh, Gordon, Gordon writes very clever music, and so when you think that um, uh, the hit's going to be on two, presume bow. It might be a one, two, bow on three instead. He just, yeah. just like where you think it's going to go. He, I, I think he does it purposefully. He just says, "No, we're going to, we're going to put it over where you don't think it is." And I'm the guy who will not be paying attention just enough to fall in all those cracks and uh and they would just they would just start hollering laughing man i mean broke the band down on a couple occasions once in rehearsal once on a gig oh wow where you know <laughs> there's a song he wrote <laughs> shouldn't tell this but <laughs> we were doing a gig at the i think it was the jazz bakery and uh it was one of my very first gigs with the band and wayne had passed me first trumpet on uh, Tom Bubba. The original one and in it after all the solis go down there's this build up and there's a bar rest when the drums hit and then the trumpet comes in on a high g mm -hmm. for a big long note with a fall and uh and i'm geared up and i'm paying attention the best i can and it's going pretty well and i hit that high g exactly a bar early <laughs> and and it's when the whole band stops and the good news is, is I got it and I was dead center and it was real cool and it was loud and it was right. And I hung on to it when the band finally did come in and then we all fell together and then the band just, just they just started dying laughing. <laughs> Nobody laughing harder than Sal Lozano. <laughs> Sal? Yeah, man, he, he, he enjoyed that as much as anybody. He actually found a recording of it and gave it to me. And, <laughs> but uh, that that's kind of what the band has been for me, you know, it, it, it before every single gig that we do, every gig, I turn to Wayne or Wayne turns to me and we go, can we do this? <laughs> and then we go, well, we're just gonna have to do our best. Wow. And that's the way we approach it because yeah. you're not gonna play the Gordon Goodwin, Goodwin band perfect. It, it, it's right. not gonna happen. You're just gonna get as close as you can. All right. Well, you could have fooled us. <laughs> uh, one thing, I'm gonna start to get to these questions. And I apologize to all of you out there. I mean, Dan, there's, he's just like a, he knows the business and I just want to get as much information as I can for everyone out there. Um, but let me ask you a question, Dan, uh, before we get into the questions. Uh, let's talk about Jerry Hay. Uh, you know, I, I, I was just listening to the track, the Dirty Loops track you guys played on that. Uh, I was listening to the, um, uh, the No Drama track that you guys did. I mean, let's talk about Jerry Hay working with Jerry Hay. Can you tell us what that's like? Well, first of all, I believe those are Wayne Bergeron on those tracks, uh, especially, I know, I don't know the, the other one you spoke of, but uh, the Jerry Hayes horn section has always been him and Gary Grant. Yeah. And, uh, since Jerry stopped playing and is, is primarily writing, it's Gary Grant and somebody else usually. Uh -huh. and usually that call goes to Chuck Finley, Wayne Bergeron. Uh, I'll get the nod once in a while. Larry Hall for, did yeah. a lot of that stuff before he retired. Uh, Rashawn Ross is uh, someone Jerry likes a lot right oh, now. Oh, okay. Yeah. I I just saw you on a video, and I'm sorry. I I thought what the well, Jerry could have been. Maybe, maybe yeah. I was on that, and I, yeah. I don't. Uh, whenever uh, the phone rings, uh, the the phone, the internet, yeah. the email comes, and it says it's from Jerry Hay. Uh, the answer is yes. It's just that's why I moved here. It was yeah. Gary, and that's the those were the guys who laid it down, the stuff that lights my fire to this day. Uh, uh, you know, anytime, anywhere, sure, yes, okay. You know, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's the way, I, that's, that's what I feel about it. Um, we've, got, we've got something coming up uh, next week that I've been asked to be involved in, which I'm thrilled about. Yeah. But uh, he's all time, all time hero, you know, uh, for me. And, you know, when Harry Kim uh, formed the Vine Street Horns in, in the early 90s, uh, it was uh, 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 Gene Burkert on sax, uh, Arturo Velasco, Harry and I. Yeah. And uh, it was just such a thrill for me because I, would, I was going to be part of a horn section that does that thing that Jerry and Gary did, you know, the thing that the Phoenix Horns did. You know, I wanted to be part of something like that. That's, that's always been the kind of music that... that uh, that sits best with me musically, the music yeah. that I am inside is most fulfilled in that context. And, you know, and so um, uh, any chance to work for Jerry is just something else. Wayne and I were doing something for him a few months back before mm -hmm. COVID. 
And we sat there and there's Jerry standing in front of us, you know, telling us, you know, bar three, here we go, here it comes guys, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, Stan Higgins and Reichenbach and the two of us. And, and, uh, and I, we turned to each other and I don't remember who said it to who, but it was like, isn't it amazing to know that any, no matter how well we play this right now, he's standing in front of us knowing he could play it better. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's amazing, man. Yeah. We we'll did that to me. They were like kids, man. You know? Yeah. That's so awesome. Uh, just one more thing. And I'm going to get the questions. Uh, you did the Arturo Sandoval. Uh, I remember Diz album. You're on that. You're on that recording date. And there were some uh, on things to come. There's this nasty trumpet thing. Yes. Uh, can you tell us about that? I mean, it's on the internet. It's on it. But can you tell us when you saw that uh, and you knew you had to track it, or were you guys like, did you guys rehearse a week before, or how? Because you guys nailed that thing. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna imagine that he had some rehearsals before that. Uh, remember specifically, but I'm gonna say probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's about as hard as anything you'll ever see. And, um, but it was cool doing it, you know, we had the right guys in there to do it. And uh, I don't think though, that what we did actually made the album. I, I think on the album, it was Arturo did it all. Oh, wow. There's, there's, I'm not positive of that. Yeah. But as I remember it going down and how we played it, when I heard it back, it sounded to me like, like maybe Arturo said, you know, I got this. Okay. Which is his record, man, <laughs> go for yeah. it. And but uh, I, what are you gonna say about that? I mean, of course. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, uh, uh, when we did it, we only got it so close and, and it was a blast doing it over and over. I mean, it, it, you know, when you're playing with guys like that, playing music that that's challenging, it forces you to get your focus on deep, you know, and getting to that place uh, and being asked to go to go in that deep and all that stuff is one of the greatest parts of, of doing this. You know, it's yeah. defining, it's, they have to really dig deep and define that in yourself and get done with it and have that that experience of it and get the satisfaction of having gone through it. It's, uh, you know, it's nothing like it. Yeah, that that's uh, so awesome. Man. I'm going to get to these questions. Okay, first question uh, for Dan. Uh, this comes from um, Brandon Luce, a good buddy of mine. What advice would you give to kids out there? Learn this stuff on YouTube. Start to get serious about music. What does it take to make it? What are a couple of important things to take care of at the beginning of their careers? Well, I mean, um, I honestly, today, if you're new and you wanna come up and you wanna be a, a performer uh, in the music business as a freelance, which is what I do, I would say to you, get a doctoral degree in education uh, learn everything you can through every possible means of music that you can be a part of through the entire process of going all the way to your PhD. Because the reality is, is that the way the music business is going today, it's it's not likely that that you can have a career as a freelance. Not likely at all, frankly. And I don't I don't mean to be discouraging or to be pessimistic at all. I just see that work is leaving and that there's there's less and less work for more and more guys. Right. And there's other opportunities though that are huge now today uh, to be heard that we didn't have when I was coming up, like YouTube, you know? You can put yourself out there every day for the world to see and there's ways to make money at that and to make a living and to get heard. If you're the next, you know, Arturo Sandoval, then you're gonna go out there and you're gonna make a living. If you're the next Alan Bazzuti, you know, Bobby Shu, you know, Sergei Nakaryakov, if you're, if you're that guy, you don't need to freelance. You're going to go out and your name's going to be on the marquee and that's how you're going to make your living. And the chances of that for people are very, very small. But if you have that and you want that and you're willing to work that hard and, and, and you know, then throw caution to the wind and go for it. But the reality is, if you got that PhD, you're going to be able to compete for that good teaching gig someday that you're probably going to need, truthfully. That's, that's you know. great advice, Dan. That's you know, great Leland, advice. Leland Scalar uh, is that that long white bearded bassist man. Yeah. He plays, you know, with with everybody in the world, and and he he does master classes and pe and he said, and he told me this personally. He said he said they asked me how can I have a career like yours, you know, mm -hmm. and he says well he says the the only way you could could have a career like mine he says is to get a hold of you know 
your best geek friends who know everything and build a time machine and transport yourself back to 1967 and give it a go. He goes, because the opportunities aren't here anymore like they were back right. then. Uh, you know, I've heard uh, a lot of your constituents or a lot of your peers talk about it's a pie that's diminishing by the day, you know, and uh, yeah. we don't know what's next. We're in an unknown right now. you know. Right. Uh, I got another a question for this is from my buddy Jack in New York City. He says, Dan, how do you become the guy that everybody want to, wants to sit next to like yourself? How do you become that guy? What kind of playing do you have to do? Well, I mean, it, one of the things that I get great musical satisfaction of is being a good section player. You know, I like sitting next to Wayne Bergeron and not playing first trumpet or sitting next to, to John Lewis and playing third trumpet and fitting into his world or, you know, Rob Scher fitting into his world. These are great, great trumpet players. And, and, and if I can fit into their goo, they're going to say, hey, man, you know, I like playing with that guy. He makes me sound good. You know, yeah. He doesn't get in my way. You know, and that's the key to it all. You know, it, I learned it when I was in when I made first trumpet in the six o'clock band at North Texas, my second semester. The, the the lab band director was a guy named Steve Spencer, who played the jazz tenor chair in the one o'clock band at the time. He was a T.A. And he uh, and he said, everybody he said, this is Dan Fernero. He's your new lead trumpet player. He says, your job is to make him sound good. I'll never forget it. And that's the truth. It. You know, we're not going to be Wayne Bergeron. You know, yeah. I'm not going to walk into an orchestra and be John Lewis. You know, but I better be able to play with those guys well. And so, if you're paying attention and you do that, you know, you can pull that off. They're going to want you back. And that's, you know, that's just it, man. And it's fun. I really, I enjoy playing section work. It's, it's a skill set that I really enjoy. You know, that's again great advice. I got another question from Tim. Tim is from Chicago, Illinois. He asks. Dan, what is the what is the number one advice you would give to being a great lead trumpet player? Listen to the drummer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean that's that's the key to it all, man. It's just to lock in there, you know, find that groove and 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 you know you want to honor the music, but you also want to put some style on it, you know, and uh, you know, there's a little bit of a dance there. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, yeah, go with the drummer, man. I was real fortunate when I got on Woody's band. They they couldn't find a drummer for the whole year I was on there. They just couldn't find a drummer. So they kept bringing back Jeff Hamilton. Nice. Hamilton came back to do the band four or five times in that year I did the band. And then they had Steve Houghton come in and they had Ed Sof come in and, you know, and, uh, and, and Jim Rupp and, and, uh, and Radicek and, and Cats were, you know, I was surrounded. The drum chair was changing because they couldn't find anybody that that they were going to keep, so they kept bringing back all the great ones. And I had, you know, and when I was in North Texas, uh, I played constantly with Greg Bissonette for years. Oh wow! You know, you, you know, and then you get to you get to LA, you know, and, and you know, and it's you know Peter Erskine, and you know, there's so many great drummers out here, you know, mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know, uh, with the. The opportunity to play with all those those people, you realize that the, the key to playing lead trumpet is make sure you're locking with those guys. Mm -hmm. You know, keep your pitch in the center. Don't don't play sharp. It, it might make you feel like you're getting a big edge to your sound. It just means you're out of tune. Yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's great. Um, you know, uh, Gary Grant always says uh, play eighty percent. You know, keep that twenty percent in your hip pocket for when you're going to need it. That's how Wayne Bergeron gets through the Jazz Police as the last number of the night. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, I just I got before I do the next question. I have a question for you. There's a story about you at Citrus College doing a session, and it was the session was I guess after a three hour session, and you had to play double A's. Uh, there was like it, they had to do it like 13 times, and you nailed it every mm -hmm. every time. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean it, the trumpet is a very demanding instrument and to do that 13 times consistently you know what what you know how, how do you how do you have like you said the 20% how do you know when you go into a session when you don't know where they're going to put in front of you you have no idea uh, how do you reserve that 20% because again when you show up you don't know what's going to be there how do you know okay well i got to pace myself 
I don't remember uh, the session you're referring to. Um, I in back, uh, you know, 20 years ago, my high A was a lot better than it is today. Um, but um, uh, if I did do that, uh, it, the key words were that it was at the end of the session, because I can turn into a different kind of a, uh, approach to the instrument. Yeah, or I'm gonna, you know, I might be able to pull that off, but you don't want to hear me play anything pretty after that, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't work so much on um, uh, in my practice uh, uh, for high notes and all of that stuff. I mostly work on on trying to maintain a, a proper technique, so that when I do go to work and it's it's John Lewis or, or Rob or, or you know, or, you know. Uh, Barry Perkins or any of these other cats, yeah. you know, where I'm going to have to blend in with them. You know, Dave Washburn. I, I need to be able to play on that side of the horn. Right. Uh, playing lead trumpet and and in your face, you know, gymnastics and all that stuff is something that comes more natural to me than uh, playing uh, soft and pretty. Uh, so that's primarily what I work on. So if they asked me to play the high A's, I might have said, "Hey, can we get to this when we're done with the session?" Because yeah. then I can come up with that kind of side of things. You know. Oh, cool. Uh, I got a, a question from Adrian. Adrian's from Sacramento. He asked, Dan, what's the hardest book you ever played? Oh, probably Woody Herman. I wouldn't hesitate to say that. Uh, after about eight months on the band, I had a very, very difficult time playing that book. Um, uh, it seemed to go real well for a while, mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't have quite uh, a, a routine and a, a disciplined routine as a, as a player yet. Yeah, I mean, I was 23 when I started on the band, and uh, at that point in my life, uh, I would, I just, uh, it's just sort of, I'd done so much playing already, and and big band was just so such a large part of my life for so long, that it was just I could just do that, but eventually, without any discipline and a proper practice routine, I, it, it it kicked my butt. And by the end of the time, uh, when I left Woody's band, I left Woody's band a year to the day. I, I joined the band the day after the Monterey Jazz Festival in 82, and I left it after we performed the Monterey Jazz Festival in 83. And um, I couldn't wait. I was counting the days so I didn't have to try to do that again, because I oh. needed to sit down and I needed to practice, you know, because it was kicking my butt. After I left the band, uh, Roger uh, Ingram became the lead trumpet player. And about a month later, they were playing at, uh, of all places, the comedy store in, on Sunset. And so I said, hey, Melinda, let's go, my wife, I said, let's go, let's go hear these guys now. Let's hear this book played properly, you know. <laughs> and, uh, they had this one tune in there called After Hours, man. And it was tune, 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 boom. But, but. And it just kept going. And then at the end, on double A's, right? Mm -hmm. And I played that. If Woody called that tune on, on a gig, I was doomed. It didn't matter. I was going to. It's going to take everything I had to get close to it and then forget what was coming after it. Yeah. You know? But Roger, they played that tune that night. And I heard Roger Ingram impale that song. <laughs> With one hand, you know, like it, he just lived for it. And when I was on Woody's band, that was the stuff that just gave me nightmares. So yeah. I, that was clearly the hardest book I've ever played. Wow. Uh, here's uh, another question from Steve. Steve's out of Texas. Steve uh, says, "Do you change equipment for different gigs, or do you play on do you play on the same equipment no matter what you're doing?" I play the same trumpet um, uh, mostly. Um, I, I'm uh, I play Yamaha trumpets, and uh, I have a Yamaha Vizuti model. I have a model uh, 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 a Vizuti second generation model, and I also have a prototype of what they're calling a lightweight, which actually I don't think they've put into production. Um, I played the lightweight on the most recent Phil Collins tour because it lent really well for that kind of playing. And that's primarily all I did for, for quite a while. And, um, but I'm um, back on the original Vizuti right now. I, I think it's a very proper trumpet. Mm -hmm. 
and I, I think that suits me best. What I do change often is mouthpieces. I play GR mouthpieces. Uh, he designed one, uh, The it's called the Fornero. It's a model 2277, I think. Uh, yeah, 2277. Mm -hmm. And that is like a, a commercialized 3C to some degree, but it's a really, really, really good all-purpose mouthpiece for me and I play on that primarily and I practice on that but if I'm playing lead there's a series of, of I don't know four or five other mouthpieces that are based off of the 2277 that go into more degrees and of towards commercial and lead playing and uh, a model uh, that goes uh, more towards symphonic is MX series um, so depending on what the music is instead of changing instruments like you know the the guys who are orchestral guys for example uh, when i go to work i'm uh, on an orchestral date there will be three other trumpet players usually playing c trumpets if it gets really gnarly they might pull out a d e flat you know but mm -hmm. very rarely do they play a b flat trumpet i'm walking in with a b flat trumpet i don't sight read real well on a c trumpet so that's just not going to keep me working if i show up with that you know <laughs> and uh so uh uh, I'll change mouthpieces according to what the music is. Mm -hmm. I'll go more orchestral mouthpiece for something like that. A lot of times I'm brought in as, as an extra guy in case the music in the middle of this film or whatever turns into uh, anything remotely commercial. They might give me the nod in that direction, you know, then I'll, I'll pop in a different mouthpiece that's appropriate for that. Right. I don't play the classical mouthpiece on the big fat band, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. I do play the 2277 as as often as I can. That's mm -hmm. that's my go-to. Um, I got another question from Rick. Rick is from Kansas City, and he asks, <clears throat> Dan, with YouTube and all these other social media platforms, do you see the industry changing for the modern day trumpet player? I think for certain that's true. Um, I don't know how it's how it helps monetarily yeah I, I understand that it does i just don't understand i don't know how okay <laughs> i don't really understand how the money comes into play on that you can create quite a demand for yourself take for example somebody like louis dowswell mm -hmm. louis dowswell out of london is the real deal that is a no joke mother and he is really wise the way he uses the social media he puts himself out there, and I assure you that he's going to make an extraordinary living across the. He'll be the next extension of of Wayne and Maynard and Chase and all those guys. He will be it. He is the cat, and um, he couldn't be a nicer guy. He couldn't have his head head on more straight too. I mean, it's it's just a perfect package, man. Yeah. And uh, and he's smart enough to know how to use that stuff. And I'm sure that it'll come. In, you know, monetarily speaking, he'll he'll live a very very fine quality of life uh, by using this. I don't get it personally. I mean, I, I'm of a different generation. So my Facebook use, I check it daily because I should. Um, I don't do Twitter. I don't do Instagram. Frankly, it's just, it's not my cup of tea. Mm -hmm. I need to maintain some sort of brand out there and I do. And some of it I find really interesting and in reconnecting with, with people I haven't seen in years and <laughs> sharing uh, uh, extraordinary stuff that other people have done and occasionally some cool stuff that I've done. But but I don't really know the answer. The, the Is the industry changing? And is that stuff a huge way that it's going to go? Absolutely. You know, I just don't understand it all yet. Okay, cool. Uh, I got another question from John. John is from, oh, right there in Los Angeles, California. He asks, Dan, who is your biggest influence in Los Angeles? Gary Grant. Gary Grant. Oh, plain and simple. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's <laughs> Gary Grant. <laughs> that's I mean, you know, it's, uh, he's just, he, he put things right down the center of the pipe yeah, with yeah. a great feel, with a great sound, with authority, with great fun and humor, and serious as a heart attack when it needed to be. Yeah. And, um, you know, extraordinary amount of stamina and, uh, style it's just uh you know and i asked him you know because we're, we're quite close and i said mm -hmm. who's who's your gary grant and without hesitating he said chuck wow there you go 
you know? Chuck. And I think Jerry would say the same thing. I think Jerry would just go, it's Chuck, you know? And if you look back on it, you go, okay, who, who ever played better than Chuck Finley? Crickets. <laughs> it, yeah, it, that's, that's, yeah, man. Uh, I've heard uh, a lot of, a lot of people say, if Chuck walks on your gig, you're going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, so um, here's another one. This is a good one. Uh, this is from Polly out of Florida. Dan, do you, do you ever get stage fright? Every time. Oh, wow. Every time. How do you yeah. cope with that? Constant. It's, um, whew, I'm, I, I'm mostly terrified to go to work. Mostly. Um, I can perform at a very high level uh, in spite of the fear, mostly. Uh, I'm at about probably a 99%. That one percent of the time it gets in my way, it's not cool, and and it's the only time I remember. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I'm 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 mostly quite. Um, I think terrified might be too big of a word, but but uh, yeah, I get nervous, and and part of that is is really beautiful, you know, in that um, uh, it keeps me honed, you know, keeps keeps me focused, you know. Uh, the fear of failure is strong enough to where. Uh, you know, it, 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 it just keeps me focused. Yeah. It can get in the way. And I've had dates where that's happened, where, uh, you know, I, you, I can't really uh, get back in control. Yeah. And it's, um, uh, it's not cool. And it, it's, uh, it's not cool. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, mostly I do really well, you know. Yeah, I hear that uh, studio work is 90% waiting, 10% terror. <laughs> so I hear. I heard that as well. Yeah. Uh, it, it it's um it's look when 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 it's like there's a big big chunk of music in front of you and it's and it's and it's going and it's and it's, and, it, and you really got to be the guy that doesn't sink this ship. Yeah. You're in that in there there's a there's a fear factor in there that is fantastic and lo and wonderful and it 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 it's um it's exciting and it's adrenaline and it's the feeling of satisfaction after something like that uh, is worth it all, you know. Yeah, it's worth it all, you know. And uh, I wouldn't change it for a, for a thing. Oh wow, that that's that's a great answer. So I got another question from Mark. Mark's right here in Phoenix, Arizona. He says, "Dan, do you currently take students?" Yes. Okay, so I could go ahead and you know uh, they can go ahead and contact you via Facebook or something like that, or yeah, or through your website. Sure. I mean, um, I do it a handful of times uh, mm -hmm. a year. I, it's not something that I'm looking forward to, uh, uh, you know, doing a lot of. Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes guys come through town, they say, hey, man, can I take a lesson? I say, yeah, here's what it costs. You know, come on to my, my house and we'll, I'll show you what I practice and how I practice it and why. And uh, if it helps you, great. If, you know, you turn it into your own thing after that. Uh, but that's all I can really offer, you know. I'm not real good with uh, uh, telling someone how to play the trumpet. I, uh, I couldn't help a beginner learn how to do this very well. It's it's something that's better left for people who understand how to explain those things. I've been doing this uh, uh, my whole life uh, from a point of view of uh, hearing the music and trying to make that recreated and and you know and and but without really knowing the how and the why of it very well. Uh, I know enough about it, how to continue to practice and get better at it, but not enough to be able to explain it. Okay, cool. Uh, got another question. Uh, this is from Jake in Las Vegas. Jake asked, let me read this correctly. Um, Dan, how did you go about picking the perfect mouthpiece for what you do? I didn't. Uh, I was... Uh, John Lewis, uh, again, if, in, in, for those of you out here who don't know who he, who he is, uh, that's J-O-N without an H, Lewis. Look him up. Uh, he's the first trumpet on the new Star Wars pictures and thousands of pictures in Los Angeles uh, for uh, decades and is easily, easily one of the finest trumpet players in the world. And uh, 
And he used to design mouthpieces and, or make mouthpieces uh, with, um, I believe it was Marcinkowitz mm -hmm. uh, for a long, long time, you know, 10, 15 years. And he ended up going to uh, Gary Radke of GR mouthpieces and having him design him one and change to it. So if John Lewis, you know, changed his, from his own design to letting somebody else design for him, that got my attention. And Wayne Bergeron got on the ropes a few years back where he was having some serious trouble, uh, if you can imagine that. And, uh, and he was given, um, uh, uh, Willie Murillo actually uh, put him in the direction of a GR mouthpiece to help him through a gig in, in Japan. And, uh, and it, it saved him. And so he went to GR and GR designed mouthpieces. So now I got, you know, Wayne Bergeron and John Lewis going to GR, I'm going to GR. And I did. And so I didn't choose my mouthpiece. Gary did. He has a oh, certain wow. of, uh, eight playing tests that he puts you through that are going to expose every difficulty you have as, that we all have as trumpet players. And while you're playing these tests, he stands next to your bell with his ear to the side of your bell, not in front of it. Yeah. And he listens and he takes notes. And, and you're just, he just tells you, just play. And so I'm playing this one thing. I said, oh, man, I'm sorry. I screwed up bar three. He said, don't worry. I'm not listening to bar three. You don't know what he's doing. Yeah. He's got a real skill set for understanding the weaknesses that you have in your own playing and how different aspects of a mouthpiece can help you. And so he designed the 2277 after two days of testing with me. And then all the subsequent mouthpieces that he's designed for me uh, are based off of that. Oh, wow. So, when you go see somebody like GR, if you're fortunate enough to do that, mm -hmm. uh, you kind of have to walk in and go, okay, you're the boss. You have to be subservient and you have to respect that he knows what's best for you more than you do. And that's the truth. And so I said, look, I, I can do that. Lewis and Bergeron, yeah, sign me up, man. This guy mm -hmm. must know what he's doing. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. You know, I, I, um, I have very little to do with with what's good for me. I let Yamaha come up with good trumpets and I let GR come up with good mouthpieces. And, and I just try to learn from everybody else around me about how to get better at this. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Did you had that yet? Uh, Gary help you with that. Uh, oh, I got another question. This is from, Oh, this is my buddy, Bobby out in Chicago. He asked, what is your what opinion do you have on being a great studio player? I'm not sure I understand. I guess he, I guess what he's asking is he probably typed too fast. Uh, what are some of the advice you have on being a great studio player? I think that's what he's trying to say. Huh. It's in Spanish and I had to translate. So, <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, You know, I just, it, it's really important to fit in musically with other players. I think that's the key to it all. It's, it's a not, it's not about walking into a, a session and going, wait till they hear me. It's about how well can I fit into this circumstance here? What, what can I bring to the table to be part of this blend that is proper? And what, you know, what is the music really calling for? You know, it's not the place to, to, to be Mr. Show Off. It's the place to fit in musically and personally. And um, I think uh, uh, finding that balance is the key to it all, really. Um, how do these guys behave when I go to work? That's probably how I should behave, you know? Mm -hmm. um, how, how do these guys approach the music? That's definitely how I should approach the music. But if you walk in there and you go, hey man, I'm here, check me out, dig me, I'm the funniest guy in the room. <laughs> you know? Or wait till you hear how I put this, you know, stamp on this note or that other note, man, I'll show you guys, you're gonna be gone, man. You know, yeah. it's not gonna work. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, again, Dan, I apologize. I'll just, I'll just, I'll okay. cut it short. I apologize, man. I have a question for you, uh, Dan. You're in a demographic where there's a lot of strong personalities, uh, you know, and you, you have to work with these guys. Whether you know, because it's, you know, uh, when you get called for a date, you, you know, let me ask you a question. When you were, in, when you're in your, in your environment, and you get vibed, or someone. You know, how do you lovingly get through the night? Because I've noticed, I mean, I, I worked a little bit in L.A. when I was a kid, and I, I don't know, I didn't, 
I didn't take getting vibed very well, you know, and it messed with my playing, you know, and I couldn't concentrate. And I, you know, I was always worried about, anyway. So what, like if someone, if someone were to vibe, and I hear this a lot of guys that work in, in LA about getting vibed and how to, how to react to it or how to just do your job. I guess that's sort of saying, what is the secret to just, you know, doing your job, even though you're getting vied by the next, by the guys you're playing next to? I don't, I don't know, man. It, it, I think it, it's in the answer. The, the answer's in the question. It's just do your job, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, we're going to work, you know, and, and uh, I'm fortunate enough that, you know, the people around me, you know, they're, they're good people, man, you yeah. know? And, uh, you know, if you occasionally run into somebody who isn't, isn't working out, that the person isn't around much longer anyway. Okay. But, you know, it doesn't, t- it doesn't take much. There's not enough work for people to put up with shenanigans in town. And so, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I think it's just, you, know, you put your head down, you do your job, try, try not to be affected by people around, try to take things personally. That's good, good, good advice in life in general. You know, it's, it's not all about me. Uh, yeah. as much as I want it to be. And, <laughs> you know, but that's the truth, man. You know, don't take it personal. You know, everybody's got their own hangups. We don't know, you know, what happened in that guy's house before he came to work today, you know, or whatever. You know, just, just put your head down, go to work, and uh, try to stay out of the drama, you know? Yeah. Uh, oh, you know, Dan, I want to thank you for your time, man. You, uh, it's Thank you for taking us to school, <laughs> I guess, and, uh, you know, showing us... Uh, you know, giving this great lesson with us. Uh, uh, guys, if you haven't heard Dan CD, uh, go to his website, danfernero.com, and check out Not So Old School. It's an amazing CD. I uh, highly recommend it. And uh, Dan, if if you were to give one advice to someone experiencing doubt in what they do, what would it be? Try to try to find uh, try to find gratitude in everything around you, you know, um, is a, is just the foundation of how to live better. Uh, I think we all experience doubt. I don't think it's uh, uh, I think it's unnatural not to, to some degree. I want to trust and know that what I'm getting is what I'm supposed to get. Stay grateful for that, you know, and move forward. Uh, the more I practice, the more the phone rings, <laughs> you know. Funny uh, how that works. <laughs> when I practice more, I gain enough confidence to go in there in spite of the fear I have to be able to, to, to perform. Uh, so I gain confidence through hard work uh, and that removes some doubt. Um, Leon Breeden, you know, the, the great director at North Texas, that was his. Uh, that was his uh, big line, you know, is he. He would say, uh, you know, for example, I think the story went that somebody came in and said, "Hey, man, you know, I've I've been here for three years, and you know, and I'm 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 still in the two o'clock band. You know, how come I didn't make it in the one o'clock band again this year?" And Leon just replied back. He said, "Leave no doubt." <laughs> yeah, yeah. The best I can come up with on that. Well, that, yeah, that's great advice, man. Uh, you know, Dan, this has been awesome, man. And I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to help us and talk with us. And uh, like I said, guys, go visit Dan at denfernero.com. And if you want to connect with Dan, he's very approachable. You can send him a message on Facebook. I'm sure he'll get back to you. Absolutely. And um, uh, thank you very much for asking me to do this. It's very flattering and I uh, appreciate it. And Dan, uh, I'm going to say this uh, for everybody that's watching. Thank you for everything you've done for trumpet players. So um, appreciate it, man. And uh, your beautiful cat. And uh, we'll hopefully see you again in the future soon. Well, thanks again. All right. Take care, everyone. We'll talk to you later. Have a great Sunday. There you go.